Crime rates in Seattle are down. So why does the public feel less safe? It's like homeless everywhere, or people doing drugs. One major problem, over a thousand people who get arrested, released, and then re-offend multiple times. The so-called prolific offenders. We have too many people who've been cycling through the criminal justice system. Local businesses are seeing red. Nothing seems to be really being done about it. How can the city strike a balance between protecting the public while breaking the cycle of crime, drugs, and often homelessness? What we're doing is not, is not working. We're going in the wrong direction. Our panel weighs in. We would like to have more tools. Finding answers to a public safety puzzle. Son of Next on City Inside Out. Welcome to this edition of City Inside Out. I'm your host, Brian Callanan. A budget battle is playing out in Seattle right now as the city council considers a new public safety plan from Mayor Jenny Durkin. The mayor is calling for an enhanced probation option to deal with a group of so-called prolific offenders continually committing crimes and cycling through our legal system. Some council members argue more diversion programs to keep offenders out of jail would be a better investment but some business leaders say Seattle needs stronger accountability when it comes to dealing with a growing crime problem. At the Wachamaya Market in the Chinatown ID neighborhood, you'll find just about everything you need. And one thing no one wants, a steady stream of thieves and vandals. We do have security staff that make multiple stops a day. President and CEO Denise Moraguchi says even when police make an arrest, these thieves sometimes simply cycle through the system and target her store again within hours of their release. Nothing seems to be really being done about it and the problem just then gets worse. Repeat offenders are a nationwide issue, raised most pointedly in Seattle this year in the system failure reports by one-time city attorney candidate Scott Lindsay. The reports, which many have criticized for their methodology, made several claims, including that 100 local prolific offenders were responsible for more than 3,500 crimes. So, is more time behind bars the answer? Moraguchi says she's looking for any option beyond the city's current Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion, or LEAD, program which helps people dealing with homelessness, mental illness, or addiction get treatment and avoid jail time. I think there needs to be multiple approaches and everyone, you know, each individual has something different going on. So lead may be right for one person, but may not work for another person. City Attorney Pete Holmes is defending his restorative justice approach. We are getting victories. Holmes, appearing on Civic Cocktail on Seattle Channel earlier this year, has been at odds with some municipal court judges regarding cases like Francisco Calderon's. Calderon has 72 convictions, including one for throwing a cup of coffee into a toddler's face in downtown Seattle. That's what the 72 convictions proves, is that putting him in jail did not work. Holmes is asking for more funding for jail alternative programs like LEAD, which has been successful in Seattle to prevent more cases like Calderon's in the future. As long as we keep pretending that the criminal justice system is, a, is the right place to address public health problems, we're going to continue to get these kinds of outcomes. Cities have become the new safety net of America. Mayor Durkin has presented a public safety plan that attempts to answer many constituents. Following the system failure reports, she convened a group of businesses and service providers to craft a four-part public safety budget proposal. Durkin wants an enhanced shelter with behavioral health services, a re-entry planner to help offenders in custody find housing, more interagency collaboration for prolific offenders, and an enhanced probation program to encourage offenders dealing with drug addictions. And give people that chance to spend less time in jail only if they agree to certain dependency treatment. I think that things are coming together nicely. As the city council considers the mayor's proposals in their budget process, the enhanced probation piece, even with a relatively small $170,000 price tag, is drawing the most criticism. Probation 
very often does more harm than good. I continue to have concerns about um, uh, the mayor's proposal to continue to double down on probation. Council President that, Bruce Harrell and about. Budget Chair Sally Bagshaw, tools. as well as many municipal judges, support the mayor's probation concept. It's really an opportunity as something other than going to jail. But there's virtually no political pushback in a plan to increase funding for the overstretched lead program and its 300-person waiting list, which brings us back to Wajamaya Market. I would say lead is a good program and it definitely could use more resources, but I don't think it's the only program. Moriguchi and dozens of other business leaders have signed a letter supporting the mayor's plan to give law enforcement and the judicial system more options in a struggle with prolific offenders that some feel Seattle is losing. We're being robbed, we're being vandalized, and, and we want our voice to be heard as well, and we want to be supported and you know, just like anyone else. And we've assembled a group of experts here to talk a little bit more about this issue, including Dan Satterberg, your King County prosecutor. Dan, good to have you here. Thank you. We also have with us John Scholes. He's the CEO of the Downtown Seattle Association. John, good to see you. Good to be here. And we also have Tara Moss. She is the project director for LEAD, Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion, for Seattle King County with the Public Defender Association. I hope I got most of that right, Tara. Yes, okay. Thank you for having me. All right, great. And also the Honorable Damon Shadid. He is a Seattle Municipal Court judge. Good to have you too, Judge. Thanks for asking. And let's jump into this. We're recording this show as the Seattle City Council is still working on its public safety budget for next year. So a timely discussion in many ways. I want to talk about funding in just a little bit, but let's get a more general overview to start. So Dan, despite the fact that crime rates are down overall in our area, you have businesses saying our problem with prol prolific offenders is getting worse. We've had some social media come on on this over the past week here. Caroline wrote in, we're too soft on crime. I feel unsafe and I'm from Boston. How do you look at this problem of prolific offenders? Why are these people continuing to cycle through our criminal justice system? Well, I agree with Ms. Moriguchi, who just said that there isn't just one answer. It isn't just lead. It isn't just the criminal justice system. And it needs to be uh, to fund the capacity of the things that we know work. And you know, we also often talk about solutions to these problems. Yeah. Nobody has a solution to this issue of chronic homelessness, uh, the opioid epidemic, and, and behavioral health crisis that are on our streets. It's, it, it's a result of 50 years of deinstitutionalization of state psychiatric hospitals and a lot of in income inequality and implicit racism. All of that it leads to this very obvious homeless situation. And when people are also using drugs every day, they have a subsistence level of crime that they have to commit. I'm not saying that we should celebrate that, we should accept that, uh, but we need to have different strategies. And I talk about strategies, not solutions. There's gonna be five or six different things that we should invest in that will work. And the court's gonna be one of them, the lead program's gonna be one of them. Uh, you know, there's a role for all of us. It's not just gonna be one thing. Okay, thank you for bringing that up. John, I know DSA, other neighborhood groups were behind public the system failure reports. This is certainly an issue businesses are very concerned about. Do you see Seattle's prolific offender problem getting worse? What are you hearing from local businesses? Why do you think this is continuing to be an issue for our city? Well, what we've seen over a two-year period is a significant increase in crimes against people in the downtown, a 40% increase over two years. And that gave us uh, cause for alarm and led us to commission this report because we suspected that there was probably a small group of people responsible for a lot of crime in our city. And that's what the report in February proved out, about 100 people responsible for 3,500 cases across the state and 1,600 cases within the Seattle Municipal Court System. So we believe the system is failing this group of individuals uh, that have really complicated uh, addictions and other and other issues are cycling through the system or having big impacts on businesses on neighborhoods are leading to an increase in crimes in certain parts of our city in downtown in Soto and Ballard and we got to come together and build a new system okay thank you uh, Tara you're dealing with an overload of cases I know with lead law enforcement assisted diversion if you could explain to us what lead is what it does and your concerns with this whole problem of repeat offenders continually cycling through our system yeah people uh, get very focused on how people enter the program which is the rest of diversion aspect of the program. Mm -hmm. An officer encounters someone who meets the cr lead criteria, can offer that person, you can go to jail, or I can do a warm handoff, that means a case manager meets the officer, 
uh, where it's most convenient to them and hand off that individual. That individual interacts with that case manager, sets up some um, initial conversation, agreement to meet, or where that person, that case manager can find that individual. Mm -hmm. And from there, that's where the real work begins. So there's a rest diversion way to go in and most commonly use what we call a social contact referral mm -hmm. way to come in, whereas community members or law enforcement don't have to arrest that individual, or potentially arrest that individual to get the person in the program. Got it. But once we're there, all the partners that you see at this table start working together. And so that's something that I really would like to emphasize is that we all talk from the prosecutor's office, the judge handles uh, a calendar with lead participants, mm -hmm. business, um, business owners and groups can refer people, get information about how people are doing. Mm -hmm. and we all make a plan together about what to do and which tool is the best tool to use okay. for lead. Okay, and we're gonna talk about some of those tools in a little bit, thank you very much. Judge Shadid, are you seeing more of these prolific offenders in your courtroom? It certainly sounds like it. Why do you think this problem has been so challenging with prolific offenders? You know, the problem with prolific offenders, we are seeing a lot coming through the court system because a lot of the prolific offenders are uh, committing misdemeanor or smaller type offenses than you would see in superior court. And I think that there's not one answer to why we're seeing an uptick with prolific offenders. Uh, but as far as how the court is dealing with it, you are seeing some changes and in innovations. Uh, where we're trying to deal with short-term interventions mm -hmm. uh, to reduce the crimes that are being committed, and then medium and longer-term interventions that help people stay out of the system once we've been able to connect them with services. Got it. And let's break that down. I'll stay with you, Judge, on this one, because uh, this next step, do Seattle and King County need a different approach to prolific offenders? A lot of people have been talking about this. I know you've presented to the King, uh, this, excuse me, the City Council about this. Leads a great program. It's working very well. We all know that. But there are some cases where maybe lead has not worked or it's taking too long to work. Talk about that, break that down, maybe some of these ideas you've had about enhanced probation, if you wouldn't mind bringing that up too. Sure, absolutely. I, I think there's a misconception where people want to think that you should have probation instead of lead or that you should have lead instead of probation. And that is just simply incorrect. Anyone who works within the court system or works with lead, I think would argue uh, against that idea that one is replacing another. The court is a shorter and medium term intervention. We will work with people from anywhere from two weeks to about a year to help them get connected with services in the community. And then the court involvement is basically done at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, LEAD, and I don't want to speak for Tara here, but it's a longer term intervention. Now, while someone is in the LEAD program, they may commit new crimes. Or when they're referred to the LEAD program, they may have crimes still pending. And that's where we enter we, we overlap with each other. Mm -hmm. And so we've been working together over the past year to make sure that people who are involved in lead but also committing new crimes uh, have a place to be heard okay. and where lead can have its input. Now that is very different than what we're proposing for enhanced probation. Okay. Enhanced probation is a new way of looking at probation where the caseworkers uh, or, or probation officers would be in the community more often. Right. They would be trying to meet the people where they are to get these shorter term interventions mm -hmm. and try to encourage people to get longer term treatment in the community. Mm -hmm. It's a new way of looking at, at probation. It's an exciting way and we were very excited about the mayor's proposal. John, I'm gonna go to you in a second, but Tara, I just wanna make sure I get you to weigh in. I'll have everybody weigh in here. Does Do the city and county need these other tools in the toolkit like enhanced probation? What do you think about that? Um, I think that when we're talking about the system's failure population, it's really important to go back to the studies that were done through King County with familiar faces. Mm -hmm. And even in the system's failure report, the, one of the hardest things was the failure to appear. These individuals who have court mandated stuff and they don't even know about it, they're not well enough to attend. That's where you need things like outreach workers and connectors. And that's mm -hmm. where I see, from my perspective, Lee does that very well, where we can then tie in and help everyone be the most successful in their other systems. Okay. Enhanced probation, though. Any any thoughts on that and specifically? No. Okay. All right. Oh, I know John had something to say about it. I think we need both, and, and both yeah. have proven effective. You look at the lead model here uh, as reduced recidivism in the University of Washington study that was done several years back when it started in Belltown. We supported that pilot. We support the expansion that's in front of the city council. A program out of Minneapolis that we've studied closely. We've gone to Minneapolis. We've brought some leaders from Minneapolis to Seattle is very probation based. It has reduced recidivism of a similar population of 100 individuals that were committing a significant amount of crime in downtown Minneapolis. They've evaluated that since 2011 when it was first implemented. They've 
They've evaluated it every year. They show reduction recidivism among that population. So it's not either or in, in our perspective. It's both, and we yeah. need to commit to expanding both. Yeah, and I guess it seems like a little bit of a balance here, Dan, between using jail time or the criminal justice system and these non-arrest alternatives like LEAD. I think some people would say these offenders need to be punished. We're not balanced at all here. Then you've got the city and county with some different approaches here, possibly uh, on the docket with prolific offenders. Let's talk about this. Enhanced probation, is that part of the answer? It sounds like it might be, but I think some people are really looking for some sort of uh, punishment of some sort for these different offenders. We need it all, Brian. We need a, yeah. a balanced menu of, of responses. Now, my office has the felony jurisdiction for right. Seattle, not the misdemeanor jurisdiction, but we do see uh, some of those crimes come to us, and, yeah. and we prosecute them, and we send people to prison for violent offenses. I do also support the part of the mayor's uh, high barrier proposal that includes this place, which is the west wing of the jail, right. because I think that the businesses and the citizens and people who see this uh, chaos in the streets, they, they just want a response. And I don't know that they care whether the response is a courtroom or whether it's social work, mm. but they just want something to happen. If someone's having a behavioral health crisis meltdown in the middle of their store, they want that person to be removed and taken someplace where they can get some help. And the west wing of the jail is already sited. It's actually pretty nice inside. It doesn't look like a jail on this yeah. different door. Yeah. Uh, and and the, the, the city and the county are gonna partner to have this place to bring people who are in crisis. And once they're there and they're calmed down and, and they can be dealt with by, by case managers and social workers, we can find a path for them to do less harm. All, all of this, to me, is in this harm reduction format. We're trying mm -hmm. to help people do less harm to themselves, and they're doing harm to themselves, right? We have a serious drug problem, yep. a serious overdose ep epidemic right mm -hmm. now. We need to, to give people the tools and the stabilizing support so they do less harm to themselves, and if they do that, they'll do less harm to the neighborhood that yep. they live in as well. Mm -hmm. But let's, I also want to be careful not to talk about these people as all the same. They're very different, yep. and so we'll deal with the violent criminals, and they will go to prison. Uh, and we will. We, that's the job that, of my prosecutors. A lot of the, uh, the the trespassing and the shoplifting cases that are that are getting so much attention, they don't come to the King County Prosecutor's Office. Right. They are municipal court. And if the municipal court doesn't have probation, then they don't really have an arm yeah. to do anything. So right. I, I think I think the court has to have. A, a, a probationary arm to, to carry forward the order of the judge. And it's certainly, yeah, please. I, um, I think that the important word here is not some people deserve punishment. I think it's a larger concept of accountability. Mm. And I think that you hear this word accountability thrown around a lot. The Business Association says people who break windows and steal should be held accountable. Uh, there's also the idea of accountability as far as when someone is in the system or getting an intervention, do we know exactly what's happening to that person? It's very important to the court to have both. Yeah. We want to make sure that there's accountability for any individual defendant, but we also want to make sure that the public understands when they're going through the system everything that happened with that person, every intervention we attempted in order to make that person uh, exit the criminal justice system as best we can. Got it. And so accountability measures for the defendant can include jail time, but they can also include treatment options and rehabilitation. And without our probation department, we would lose the most crucial tool in our toolbox yeah. for short-term interventions to help people get into treatment and help people get connected with the community. Well, and it sounds like there's at least a little bit of a gap when it comes to the, some of the behavioral health issues. Would you agree in terms of what you're dealing with your caseload? I'm not sure I know what you mean. With regard to the different services that people need, uh, behavioral health services, that's another piece to this too. It is, and I preside over the mental health court. And when they're Seattle. mentally incompetent, et cetera, that's a big issue. Exactly, and, and there are a lot of issues. That could be a whole show. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in and of itself, <laughs> right. but uh, as a short way of answering, uh, people who are not able to go to trial because they can't assist their uh, lawyer or they right. don't understand the proceedings, uh, there are very limited options for those people, and one of the options is not to go through the criminal justice system. Yeah. Uh, and I think that the public misunderstands this because at least some of the prolific offenders are dealing we're dealing with are people who are incapable of going through the criminal justice system. Got it. Terry, you had something yeah, to say. Yeah, I just, um, there are limited options, but that's one of the things when we're talking about lead expansion yeah. that we have, we call what is the true blood population, the people yes. who are, where competency is being brought up. And this is why I say I'm not the lawyer you know, yeah. at the table, but when competency is being raised or, or someone won't be able to stand trial, that's where lead has enhanced services, working with DSC, community house, and off, often that 
that coordination and communication that's still happening with law enforcement to address that population where uh, the court may not be able to. Got it. And uh, John, maybe I'll go to, to you on this issue here. I, some thoughts about where the council appears it will be investing its public safety dollars uh, next year. Looks like it's three and a half million dollars going towards LEAD, added up with some of the county dollars grant money, adds up to about 9.85 million in LEAD spending for the year 2020. It looks like a good investment there so far in terms of what the county and city were trying to do. What do you think that kind of money might do? Is that an adequate investment? I know there are some other investments you'd like to see too. I think it's an important start, and I hope the council will take the input that we've jointly provided, lead to the Downtown Seattle Association and a number of neighborhood business associations and Visit Seattle sent a letter in a couple weeks ago. Yeah. We're aligned on this. We need to expand lead and we need to be investing in some new efforts as well that have been proposed by the mayor, including the West Wing that, that Dan mentioned. We've got to try some new things. The status quo I don't think is working for anybody. It's not working for the neighborhoods. It's not working for folks who are trying to connect to services and turn their life around. It's not yeah. working for the business community. And it's really expensive to the public sector in police costs, court costs, prosecuting costs. Uh, it's dysfunctional, it's, it's expensive, we need to try some new things. So I hope they'll take the input uh, that we've jointly provided. We're aligned, I think, in a lot of our thinking on um, what the mayor's recommend recommended and the opportunity to expand and build on lead. Terry, your thoughts about this investment. Is it enough? What's it going to do, I guess? Yes. Um, well, what's going to do is what uh, a problem that we have right now is we have proven that lead is successful for individuals, but mm -hmm. communities don't see a huge change right now. If, if there is just a few people on every other block, there are lead participants or lead mm -hmm. eligible, they're not feeling like there's a change in terms of public safety. Yeah. So what this allows is, is a couple things. For lead to work well, we say at fidelity. Uh, case managers, caseloads need to be low. As I keep saying with this population, it's important that you outreach with them, you connect with them, you're re-coordinating, you're talking to your prosecutors, you're showing up to court hearings with individuals. So out, uh, the case managers need to have about 25 clients. They have double that. Mm -hmm. So they will be more responsive. But then as well, it will allow law enforcement to reform more people and the community. We had to shut down most community referrals. People that they identified were a problem and they didn't think that going to jail or, or going to the courts were right, were the, the right solution. And we had to shut that down because, as you said, we have a 300-person wait list, and that's all law enforcement identified individuals who haven't been outreach and intake. Yeah. And on top of that, we have, just in the past week, new officers who have never even done lead before referring people in. Yeah. We have officers in areas that we're not in yet trying to sneak people across the border to refer them sure. because they like this as a tool. So we right. give that tool back to them. Okay. Uh, Judge, I want to make sure I touched on this. Along with the lead investment, the council is definitely talking about studying the impacts of the probation system that the municipal court has. The idea is let's see what more money for LEAD does, then see if more investment and probation is needed. That's what I gleaned from a recent budget hearing on this. What impact do you think this investment as LEAD is going to make and this approach will have when it comes to prolific offenders? As far as the investment in LEAD, I support it. Yeah. I, I think it's a great idea. And uh, as far as the participants who are in LEAD who will uh, be in my court, Right now we're looking at, at any given time, 20% of the total population in LEAD is also involved with my court. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we provided a, a space for those people to come once a week so that the case managers can all come to one place and, and deal with that. With the LEAD expansion, we anticipate, based upon uh, Ms. Dugard's numbers, that it'll probably double. Uh, therefore, we'll, we'll have double that amount coming through our court. Yeah. Uh, and so we have the capacity to work together with LEAD on those cases, and, and we're looking forward to the collaboration. Okay. Thank you very much. We need to start wrapping up the show. I'm going to ask for a final statement here. Dan, I'll start with you. I want to talk about just the future of, of LEAD and dealing with prolific offenders. What is it going to take to make a dent in this problem moving forward? What do you tell businesses, property owners that are so frustrated about this right now? What I say is that your frustrations are legitimate. And uh, this is different than it used to be, and it's yeah. more visible. And 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 the fear of disorder is is a real thing that we have to to deal with to defend Seattle's reputation as number one, a safe city yeah. with low crime rate. And that's what that's what the facts tell you. But it, that's not much consolation if it was your car that was just broken into. Yeah. I, I don't think we've overreacted to this, this problem. I think we've underreacted to this problem. We have a massive homeless situation. Twelve thousand people who are sleeping outside yeah. somewhere. But that's not something that we can't uh, grapple with. I mean, a very imaginative, innovative, affluent community, if we came together with some ideas about how to get people off the streets, out of derelict vehicles, yeah. into shelter, uh, and then into transitional housing. And, and I mean, that, we can do this, yeah. but we have to react 
react in a way that's the commensurate with the challenge before us. I think we've underreacted, not overreacted. Uh, John, your thoughts on this. Where do you see this issue of prolific offenders going in the future? How might DSA continue to be trying to be part of the solution there? What final message do you have for maybe businesses and the public feeling the impact of this problem? Well, I think we have to acknowledge what we're doing is, is, is not working. There's some important things that we've started here that have a lot of promise, but collectively uh, what we're doing is not, is not working. We're going in the wrong direction. We're seeing crime go up in, in certain neighborhoods. We're seeing people cycle through the system. And that has big impact on companies and businesses like YGMI and other neighborhoods and big cost to the system. And there's an opportunity to do something different. And we don't have to invent it here necessarily. We can take lessons from other places and we can build on the successful models like LEAD that we've uh, piloted uh, here in Seattle. So we need to move with a greater sense of urgency because what we're doing now is leaving people outside to uh, struggle and in some cases die, have a big impact on neighborhoods, and it's really expensive. So we can free up resources by making smarter decisions, better integration and coordination among all the different entities that have responsibility to Thank keep you. our community safe. Thank you for that, John. Terry, your, your thoughts about this, progress you're hoping to make with this issue in the future. What do you tell people who are very frustrated with this situation right now? Yeah, that um, it's understandable that they're frustrated from business owners to people who are living on the streets and that we need to find solutions that work. Um, and that's really important and that we continue to um, fund and support solutions that we know do work and that we continue to coordinate, collaborate, and, and work on how to solve the problem. Um, I think that the council is making some really effective next steps to really make it felt in terms of the city of Seattle of trying to address these problems in a responsible way. Hopefully by the year 2023, I know that's a target that a lot of people are looking at. What do yeah. you think about that? Um, I think that that's a good target if we, we are making a big investment to, to have a successful solution. Okay, Judge, final word to you. Your thoughts about the future of this issue here. What do you tell folks that are very frustrated about it right now? Yeah. Well, our probation department at Seattle Municipal Court is on the forefront of best practices around the country. We've been innovated, we've been working hard to make probation as a positive as we can for the people who are coming through the court. Mm -hmm. And we've been lucky in the past to have the council support our probation department and fund our probation department. We would like to have more tools. We're not ready to give up on anybody, including prolific offenders. We would like to see them get the help they need and we'd like to see them uh, exit the criminal justice system. LEAD is a great program. The court feels it has a strong voice and a strong uh, tools in order to help people exit the criminal justice system. And we're looking forward to working with everybody on it. Okay. Thank you all for your input here. And we will be right back. I haven't been attacked personally, but you never know. Maybe it's a matter of adding more, you know, street cops. If you treat the drug problem, that's how you treat the homeless problem. And that's how you clean up the uh, Seattle. Seattle's trying to help people, and uh, that's a good thing. We'd like to know what you think. Send us an email at contact at seattlechannel.org or find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Before we close today, it's time for our weekly CIO poll. Do you support creating and funding new alternative programs to deal with prolific offenders? Yes, no, or are you undecided? We want to know what you think. Cast your vote and weigh in with your comments at our website, seattlechannel.org slash cityinsideout. While you're there, you can watch our programs online anytime. Coming up next time, an update on the homeless crisis. Seattle and King County are planning to create a regional authority to tackle the growing problem. Will it make a difference? That's next time on City Inside Out. I hope you join us.